Good afternoon, CS19. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. Um, hey, welcome back from the break. I hope you guys had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I hope you had a chance for some rest, some relaxation, uh, possibly some good food and some family time. Uh, and it's really wonderful to see you. I, of course, in the holiday spirit, took some time to think about the things I'm grateful for. And how lucky am I to be here doing the job that I love the most, which is teaching with such a wonderful group. Uh, I am getting a little sad that we're getting close to the end of the quarter. I'm like, ah, I will miss you guys. Anyways, that's, that's not what's important right now. Okay. It's been a while, so I thought it'd be nice to just take a moment and recap where we left off before we jump into today's great topic. In CS109, we're on this final part of the class where we're learning about machine learning. It is going to take us to the point where we're going to learn how deep learning, aka neural networks work. But in order to understand that, you need to know the most core classification algorithms, naive Bayes and logistic regression. And those two algorithms, like all of deep learning, rest upon a foundation of parameter estimation. If you have any probabilistic model, how could you estimate the numbers that could make the probabilistic model accurate or inaccurate? Machine learning, when we talk about it in CS109, it's generally a pretty simple process. This is the process of you're going to be building a model, which we sometimes think about as these black box models, where somebody could give you inputs, features for a particular individual. Uh, your black box module will do some work and it'll come up with a prediction. And the work that the black box module does will be based on some numbers, some key numbers that we call parameters. And a lot of work in machine learning is setting these parameters so that your black box is able to make good predictions. Particularly in CS109, we've been talking about a specific prediction type called classification. And classification is where you're not just predicting anything, you're predicting discrete class labels. Like for example, one or zero, will somebody have a healthy heart? One or zero, will somebody like a movie? Or one or zero, somebody coming from particular ancestry? The most interesting part of machine learning comes in what we call training. So in the first step, you formalize a problem. You take a real world problem, you make a model, you come up with a formal model that has parameters, but the interesting thing is when you take data and use those data to learn the parameters. Uh, the, once you've done that though, it is worth noting that it is beholden upon you to try and estimate how good your algorithm is. So we will reserve some data for testing and then we can say, we've got an algorithm, it's trained, and this is how accurate we think it is. Training data often has this crazy notation. In order to gain intelligence for a classification task, I'm gonna give you a bunch of data. We call that data training data. And training data is going to be a combination of features and you're going to be told the label for this uh, particular individual. So you say, in my training data, here's one individual. They've got these features and a one or zero for their class label. This is generic. It works regardless of what problem you're talking about, but it does have some notation I don't want to lose people on. This superscript is saying which individual we're talking about. The X are the inputs, AKA the features, and the Ys are the labels. M is the size of the features. So how many inputs do I have per individual? I found that notation quite hard, so I spent a little time in class making sure that we understood uh, what that notation was. Uh, and particularly, you know, if you have uh, an individual, we think of the X's as being the list of numbers for the inputs, and there'll be M of those, and the Y being the prediction of healthy or not healthy. In training data, you're told both X and Y, and the real interesting thing is to build a machine where you could just put in inputs and it would predict the why. Okay, maybe questions about you know, this general idea of classification before we jump into the one algorithm we've got so far, Naive Bayes. Well, just before the break, we talked about an algorithm how you could do classification. We said, okay, if you wanna build this black box where it's gonna take some inputs and make a prediction, one way you could do that is you could make a little probabilistic model, and that probabilistic model is going to be able to compute what's the probability that y equals one given x, and the probability that y equals zero given x, and then we're either gonna choose our prediction to be one or zero, classification has to give back one or zero, based on this probability. Very reasonable thing to do. Uh, and particularly, you know, imagine this, if you had this probability, we'll try y equals zero, uh, and we'll try y equals one, and whichever one is the larger value, that's the prediction we'll make. 
That's why this argmax exists, just so we can turn a probability into either a zero or a one. Naive Bayes, though, while this was a nice idea, didn't work. We couldn't make a probabilistic model that would generally work, so we made this awfully incorrect but very helpful assumption that the probability for any individual of their inputs given their output is equal to the probability of each input on its own given the output. So this is a whole vector of numbers. So it's the probability of x1, x 2 x 3 x 4 given y. We're going to say that's going to be the product of each feature. We assume the features are independent of each other given the class label. Now this was the derivation and the naive Bayes assumption shows up right here. But importantly, you know, if you make this assumption, then you end up with a way to make your prediction. We use log probabilities because numerical, um, making sure it works on the computer is very important. And the product of a bunch of probabilities could become quite small. And you know, we do this derivation. It leads to this very simple way of how we can make our predictions. All these things are learnable. You are now tasked with, based on your training data, learning this probability. The probability that y equals zero, and the probability that y equals one. You also have to learn each of these probabilities. For every feature, what's the probability that each feature takes on its value given y equals either zero or one? Those are all very, very doable things. Uh, particularly, if you want to learn each of these things, it's just going to be counting. MLE says these are Bernoulli's, so we can estimate these Bernoulli's based, the probability p of these Bernoulli's just counting. Then we went really deep into this MAP, this Bayesian way of parameter estimation, and it just ended up, if you had a Laplace plier, of being counting with a little bit of addition. So long story short, we have an algorithm. It's called Naive Bayes. It uses this awful assumption, but it turns things into just counting. So training just becomes counting, and then predictions just require you to put you're counting through um, the particular function that we derived. So at this point, we have an algorithm, which is fantastic. But there are other algorithms. It turns out there's other algorithms that you absolutely should know, because some of these other algorithms have changed the way that the whole world works of artificial intelligence. And we're going to learn about that today, but a little bit more background that's worth recalling is optimization. When we were talking about parameter estimation, one of the great ideas that we came up with was, if you want to find parameters that maximize likelihood, you're actually doing an optimization task. You're saying, I am going want you to choose parameters for me, and I want those parameters to be such that the likelihood is as large as possible. And we figured out that this was kind of like an optimization task. And in order to do that, we said, you know, we can use hill climbing, particularly we could use gradient ascent. And gradient ascent tells you that if you can give me the derivative of the thing you care about with respect to each of your movable dials, if you give me those derivatives, then I've got a very simple algorithm to come up with very good parameters. So a little bit of recall, gradient ascent. Gradient ascent, gradient descent are uh, brother and sister algorithms. One could just be optimizing the negative of the other. And just to recall, you have a way of optimizing parameters for a likelihood function and its gradient ascent. Okay, so this wasn't that important. Okay, and review. Whew, that was a lot, but feel free to ask questions if you forgot something and you want me to recall it. This is supposed to be a conversation. In fact, what you're learning today, you're going to have to program in your problem sets and it's something crazy important for the world, so I want you guys to understand it deeply. I would like to invite you to ask the questions you're curious about because other people in class will be curious about it as well. It's time. One of my favorite things to teach, logistic regression. A very simple algorithm for making a classification prediction that is going to be very impactful because it is, in fact, the heart and soul of deep learning. If you've heard of neural networks or deep learning, it is a bunch of logistic regressions put on top of each other. So learn logistic regression, it is critically important. In order to understand logistic regression, we are going to be taking advantage of some of the parameter estimation we've seen so far. Okay. I know I just gave you a lot of review. I'm just gonna give you a tiny bit more mathematical background because I don't want to lose people on some prerequisites that you might not have seen before. 
Well, this is less of a prerequisite, but it's just more of a cool thing to know. There is this function that people in AI love. It's called the sigmoid function, which is so confusing. Why is it so confusing? Because we've seen sigmoids before. When have we seen sigmoids? Variance. Yeah, as the variance of, say, like a normal distribution. Hey, you guys, this is an interesting day. Before pandemic, I had this policy of bringing fruit to class. And if people asked questions or interacted, I would give out fruits. And then, you know, the whole world stopped with COVID and you couldn't throw like fruits through Zoom. So I stopped. And then we came back, but, you know, just giving fruits didn't feel right when we were all so worried. Um, but I have fruits again for the first time in like three years. So this is a special day. And so anyways, ask a question, get a little Mandarin. You can eat after class, share it with your friends as you like. But anyways, as we last left off, sigmoid's a confusing name because it means a very different thing. This symbol is also used for variance. The sigmoid function is a totally different thing. The sigmoid function is just a, a, a way of writing this whole piece of math in a condensed way. And this whole piece of math is saying, take some input and take one divided by one plus e to the power of negative that input. If you were to graph it for all the different possible inputs, it looks like this. And people in AI and probability love this function for two reasons. One reason is it's a squashing function. No matter what number you put into this, your output will be between zero and one. And I don't want to give things away, but people in probability love that because if you can guarantee that your output's between zero and one, then it starts to look like something that maybe you could call a probability. Anyways, this is just a function you should know. Uh, we haven't used it for anything too deep. I have written the function itself over here on the board. Uh, Caution, not the same sigma that you learned about when you were a wee kid in the first half of CS109. Another thing I want to put in our background before we jump into things is some key notation. You've probably seen this in like Math 51 or something like that before, which is the transpose of two vectors. If theta is a vector and x is a vector, and they're of the same length, uh, theta transpose x is another way of writing this sum. It's saying take the first element of both of these vectors, multiply them together, then add that to the product of the second element and add that to the product of the third element and the product of the nth element. So this is really what that is saying, but you can imagine these three are three different pieces of notation for writing the exact same thing. It is saying an element-wise product and then the sum over, uh, the sum over the element-wise product. Again, I wrote that over here. You know, Theta transpose x is this sum. You'll notice on the board, I actually had this starting at zero, not one. It depends how you index your list, but I'm going to start indexing by zero in a little bit, which you'll see when we get there. Any questions on this notation? Don't get lost on notation. Why would you want to get lost in background? Um, anything confusing, or what is confusing about this? Just want a Mandarin? Anybody just want a Mandarin? Yeah. I just want to make sure I clarify, is, the, is theta a matrix or a vector? It's going to be a vector. So if theta is a vector and x is a vector, so x could be like, for example, this is generally true if x is a vector, but maybe it could be a list of features. OK, and we're going to try something because I'm afraid of breaking camera. We're going to pass this back. OK, fantastic. Now, if you want to be super fancy, when you do this, you end up with this big calculation, but if you were to actually get a computer out and evaluate this, this would be a number. And because this is a number, you can put it into that function. So you can take this calculation, take the number that results, and put it through the sigmoid. Uh, notationally, if you did that, you could say that's the sigmoid of theta transpose x, um, which would be the same as the sigmoid as that, or the sigmoid of that. These are three different ways of writing the same thing. Um, or you could just put that number into the sigmoid itself. OK, a little bit of my notation. But that's just abstract. Like, we haven't put this into any uh, point of our derivations. OK, some background. I put on the board. Keep it in mind. And if you have questions later, ask me. Oh, the chain rule. Man, I remember when I learned this in math. And it wasn't motivated at all. We're like, just going to learn calculus. And because we were learning calculus, you needed to know the chain rule so you could do the things that were on the final. I wish my math teacher had told me this was the idea that would mathematically change the world. Like the chain rule is the reason that we can stack 
things that are derivable on top of each other and have neural networks learn through the whole thing because computers can do the chain rule. It's crazy important. But anyways, the chain rule says, you know, if you have some function and you can decompose it, uh, you could say if f of x, you want to derive it with respect to x, if you can decompose this into saying like f is actually some other function z of x, uh, you can do f of z with respect to z. So, you know, reference how this function changes with respect to its input and then derive f of z or z with respect to x. Just want to recall this, but I think if you haven't seen chain rule, A, please do watch your favorite Khan Academy video on the chain rule. Um, and second, I will show you it in action and you should particularly make sure you understand chain rule in the context I talk about it today's class. Okay, I'm so excited. We've done our hard work, we've done our review, we've done our background, it's time to have a big party and learn about logistic regression. Chapter one, the big picture. We want to invent the next classification algorithm. In classification, you're going to be building a machine where you put in inputs and it makes a prediction. And we decided that a really good way to build this machine would be if we could calculate the probability of the output taking on the value 1 or 0 given the inputs. If we could know that conditional probability, we could make a really great machine. Naive Bayes tried to do this. And in order to do this, it made this really big assumption. You know, the probability of each feature given y being the product of each feature on its own given y. It's helpful, it made the math really simple, but it's definitely wrong in some cases. It's not always true that the features would be independent of each other given the output. But the simple idea that is going to drive all of today is a bit of a light bulb moment. What if we just allow this to be a bit more of a machine that we construct? What if we just build a machine that could directly figure out the probability of y given x? And that was the simple light bulb idea that led to logistic regression. The simple idea was, okay, we've got our x's. That's going to be a list of ones and zeros. We have to predict our y. That's either going to be a one or a zero. And the simple idea of logistic regression is, well, what if we just constructed a machine that took those x's and predicted y. And we allowed that machine to be, you know, a little bit more flexible than say something that had to be a naive Bayes model. And particularly, people started using this one specific machine. They said, okay, I'm going to build a machine where I'm going to take each of these numbers, my machine's going to have a weight for each number, I'm gonna weight each number, sum them all up, sum up all those weighted things, and then I'm going to get a number which I'll squash, and I'm going to call the squash thing the probability that y equals 1. Poo, craziness. Let me give you that picture in a little more detail. Logistic regression assumption is, I'm just going to build you a machine that's got some parameters in it that are movable. You're going to choose great values of parameters such that your machine when it takes in x's, just outputs things that are close to the probability that y equals 1, given those particular inputs. Here, I, I think this machine is so important to understand. It's one of the most important machineries to get your head around, so I spent some time trying to make this machine look a little prettier than just that equation. People said, okay, you're going to take your inputs and you're going to predict whether or not y equals 1, so you want the probability that y equals 1 given your inputs. We're going to have a probability producing machine take all your inputs and every input is going to go through this channel where it gets weighted. It's going to be weighted by parameters and then every channel, once it gets weighted, is going to come into big summation unit. We're going to weight each channel and then sum them together. You could call this sum z if you wanted. Now, when you take in inputs and you weight them and you sum them together, there's no guarantee that this looks anything like a probability. So then what we're going to do is we're going to put it through a squashing function. And this squashing function will take this number and make it look like a probability. And then the craziest thing is we're going to interpret that as the probability that y equals 1. Craziness. I use this metaphor of a soundboard where each of your parameters are movable dials. And you can move them to change the thetas and that would change how your machine works. Okay. In my cartoon, just to be clear, these are the inputs. You know, you could have a 
everything you're making prediction of will come with a list of inputs. And we're just gonna set the machine to start out with whatever those inputs are, if we're making a prediction. For example, if you're predicting whether or not somebody likes a movie, the inputs could be yes or no, did they like other movies? The output is also in this case going to be a one or a zero, and it's gonna be yes or no, did they like the target movie? And we would like it so that this machine, when you take an individual and you set whether or not they like these three different movies, once it's weighted those ones and zeros, sum them up, put it through its squashing function, we would like the probability that comes out to be as close as possible to the true probability that this individual would like that movie. Can I be clear about something? Is this how the world really works? Is there something true about the universe that like when probabilities are being produced, it actually underneath the hood, the universe is making this little machine and um, you know, pushing pro these inputs through these weights and then squashing it? No, there's nothing realistic about this. It's wrong. Why would we use a wrong model? Because it turns out this wrong model is very useful. So we're gonna make this little machine, and the most beautiful thing about this machine is it's going to end up being a Lego block, and we'll be able to stack them on top of each other. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Yes, question. Where are the coming from? Good question. I haven't told you yet, but it's gonna be really important. If I put random thetas, I've got a random machine, but my claim for you is if some you know, Oracle came and gave you the best setting of thetas, then maybe this could be pretty reasonable. But your question is, where did they come from? Oh my God, I'm gonna tell you ahead of time. It's gonna come from parameter estimation. But, 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 but I haven't told you that, don't, you know, here you go. I never heard it. Okay, question and question. Uh, does it return one the squashing function just returns a value more than zero point five? So yeah, the squashing function is gonna give you a number between zero and one. And yeah, we are going to say like, if it gives you a value of 0.8, we're gonna assume that's, that's the probability that y equals one. If the probability that y equals one is greater than 0.5, we're just gonna predict a one. Okay, yeah. So at the moment, it seems like our sigmoid function is kind of just an arbitrary choice. Like if we wanted to get a number between zero and one, like I might have just taken the average of, like so isn't our result <laughs> heavily dependent on the arbitrary choice of the squashing function? Yes. Okay, next question. No, I'm just joking, okay. <laughs> you say like, hey, you, I could have come up with a different squashing function that could make this thing that's real valued and look, make it look like a probability. And people have. You know, sigmoid, actually, it's not old school, but you know, there's other different squashing functions that people now consider using, and some you know, neural networks will use different squashing functions other than a sigmoid. So you're right, it was a bit arbitrary, but boy, does it work. Yes, question in the back. Uh, do we consider different xi's for whether y is one or zero? Um, you know, the, the meaning of xi's are going to stay the same. Like x3 will always be whether or not somebody likes Pulp Fiction in this case. Um, and the values of those xi's will depend on the individual that you're making the prediction for. So if an individual comes, I will put all their values of what they like for this movie, and then I will predict the y. So I wouldn't say that the x's depend on the y, sorry, the y, the x's depend on the y's. Rather, I would say in our machine, you set the x's and we predict the y's. And I'm afraid of throwing an orange that far, so please come after class and grab your, your Mandarin. Okay, so we've got inputs, we've got weights, aka parameters, we have the weighted sum. This will be a number where every input has been weighted. We add them together, get the weighted sum. At this point, we've calculated you know, this, the sum of all the inputs weighted by their particular weight added together. This is a number at this point. And then we squash that number and we call the resulting of the squash a probability. We then make our prediction. And this is it. This is the logistic regression model, AKA assumption. Now, a great question was, where did you get those parameters from? The parameters really matter. If I gave you different parameters, you would probably end up with different predictions. Similarly, if you change the inputs, if you have the model, if different people show up and they have different tastes, like somebody doesn't like the Patriot, that can also change the output of this model. So this model is based on two things, the input of the individual you're making the prediction for and the parameters that have been set. The parameters are generally set for everybody, whereas each individual input will have different, what we call features, different X's. 
Okay, so putting that back into the language of mathematics. Logistic regression makes this assumption that probably that y equals one, given all the features, is going to be sigmoid of z. And in that sigmoid of z, we're gonna add up the weighted sum of all the features. Oh wait, but there's this one extra number. Oh man, let's go back. If a user likes these three movies, I say, okay, Independence Day, we set that to zero. Patriot, they like it, so we set it to one. Pulp Fiction, they like it, so we set it to one. What is going on with that x zero? It doesn't correspond to a movie, and it's always set to one. Huh, that's a bit of a mystery. Here's what that mystery is about. People realize this model does way better when it's allowed to have a particular parameter which can offset the result of this uh, equation. So if you have this weighted sum, people like to have a, a parameter that you could just add to it. For simplicity, what we would do is we would take the inputs, the features, and we'd always set a zeroth value, and we would always set it to one. Because if you set a zeroth value to one, then your weighted sum just becomes a weighted sum where the first input will be a one times by theta zero. And one times theta zero is just going to give you theta zero. It just allows you to add in this intercept. This is a detail, obviously, it's not that critical to the whole plot line. But this detail is gonna be critical when you actually have to go code this. It makes a big, big difference in whether or not this model works. So the detail here is, yes, we're going to make this assumption and it's going to allow us to calculate this number, which is the weighted sum of each input multiplied by a feature. We're gonna squash that, but before we squash it, we're going to add in some other theta. So there's a bunch of parameters in this model, and one of them just corresponds to what we call the offset. To make this easy in your code, you're just gonna take every input, and you're going to make add in a one before it, and then that one will be multiplied by a theta, uh, and that will make this the offset. Okay, I think that's a little bit confusing, so if somebody could ask me a question, that would be wonderful. Yes? Can we also consider that as the base case? So like if all the other things were zero, that would be true? Yeah, it is a bit of a base case. You know, another terminology for exactly the same intuition is it kind of biases the machine to either predicting more people liking the movie or not liking the movie. Like, let's say your output is a super popular movie. You might wanna bias it so that you predict that people like this movie more often than not. Uh, and so you can think of it a bit like a base case if everything else is zero, this is going to be influencing the movie a lot. And generally this can either make you more likely to predict one or less likely. Come back and get your Mandarin after class. <laughs> it's been a while, I'm not so confident in my throwing long distance. Okay, so anyways, one thing I haven't told you. This model predicts the probability that y equals one. Where is the model that predicts the probability that y equals zero? You guys are far enough into probability that you won't be surprised for me to tell you, you don't need another model. If you've got a model that predicts y equals one, and if you wanna know what's the probability that the prediction, you know, that the output class is a zero, you can just take advantage of the class that probably that y equals zero given x plus probably that y equals one given x should be one. So if you want the probability that y equals zero, if that was your assumption for what's the probability that y equals one, Probably y equals zero is just gonna be one minus that. Okay, moving and grooving. And it all just comes down to this. This is the plot line so far. Logistic regression gives us this assumption that you can figure out the probability that your output being taken on the value one can be calculated using this simple mathematical or computer programmed uh, function. The sigmoid of the weighted sum of all of our inputs. Sigmoid function looks like this, and I think some people started to intuit this, but I want to be very clear. In this model, we're going to do the sigmoid of this weighted sum. So it's worth understanding the sigmoid function. And one thing knowing about the sigmoid function is this input's always a number. If that input is positive, so if the thing that goes into the sigmoid is greater than zero, then the output is going to be greater than 0.5. So if z is greater than zero, sigmoid of z is greater than 
If sigma y z is interpreted as the probability that y equals one, as soon as the input to the sigmoid gets positive, we'll predict that this is a one. As soon as the input to the sigmoid is negative, we're gonna predict zero. Why? Because if the input to the sigmoid, the thing that goes in here, is negative, then the result of the sigmoid will be less than 0.5. And if the probability that y equals one is less than 0.5, we're gonna be predicting the other class label, which is zero. Again, questions, comments, concerns? As I said, this is how we're going to define one neuron in a neural network, so it's worth getting your head around. So, if you have the weighted sum, um, why do you even need to put it into the sigmoid function if you already know whether or not it's going to be above or below 0.5? Such a good question. So, just to say that back to you, you're like, hey, if I want to actually program this thing up, could I just get this weighted sum? and then just check if it's positive. Forget the rest, and if it's positive, I predict a one. If it's negative, I predict a zero. You're absolutely right for the prediction. But when it comes to the other part, training, this theory is going to be very helpful because it will tell us how we can update. Um, and you know, even though you're right, you could also still use this mechanism if you want to tell somebody not just a one or a zero, but you say, this is a one with probably 0.99 versus this is a one with probability you know, like 0.55. So you might want to give more information to the user where this is still useful. And also for the other theory, we're going to need this. Ah, so close. <laughs> no one was hurt for people watching online. Yes, question. Can you just run the function on each uh, theta times xi in some data? No, I don't think that would give you the same answer. It's not so, linear? Yeah, it's, it's, it's this thing, the sigmoid function, to get really mathy, is this thing called nonlinear. So you can't do a sigmoid of each theta j times xj and then add those up. That would give you a different number. Yeah, good question. That turns out to be a really, really useful thing when you start putting these together. So what is now annoying will later be useful. Question. So just zooming out a little bit, it seems like this method is for the most part better than naive base because it you know, makes a assumption that doesn't sound this is crazy. Okay. Um, is, yeah. is that usually the case, or does it really depend on the situation? And if so, how can you know which one is better? Okay, good, 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 good. So the question is, hey, Naive Bay has made this assumption that we thought was crazy, and this feels better because the assumption isn't as crazy. Which one is better? It turns out in most cases where you're either using logistic regression or naive Bayes, they're often pretty similar, and it turns out the decision is more often defined by do you have things like continuous inputs? Like when you start to break out of binary values, then one tends to be more useful than the other. But right now, if everything's binary, they look very similar. Um, the naive Bayes assumption generally is pretty good. Why wouldn't this be as good? Like why wouldn't this just like blow the pants off of naive Bayes? It's still making assumption. Like this isn't the naive Bayes assumption, but it's a pretty simplistic assumption. Like probabilities in the world are nuanced. Maybe there's much more complexity that goes on to how y ends up being one. Uh, and it, it's not just the simple uh, linear sum thrown through a squashing function. Good question, yes. That's right. Yeah. So how do you get a negative value? Do you want to be negative? The weights can be negative. So the question is like, how could you get a negative value? If these thetas are negative, then you can end up with a negative value. And the thetas absolutely can be negative. They're not constrained in any way. They could be anything from negative infinity to positive infinity. What a good question. Let's actually write that. Let's say our thetas, so theta j is going to be an element of any real number. So it could be negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay. A little bit more exposition. You know, we didn't talk too much about linear uh, regression, but linear regression is doing a different thing than classification. Right now we're predicting ones and zeros. Regression is generally what we call it when you predict real numbers. Classification is when you predict something like, you know, y is a one or y is a zero or y is a discrete value. Linear regression is a name for an algorithm that does regression. I love it. Naive Bayes is the algorithm for the first classification that we've seen so far, and I love this question. It's using Bayes' theorem, it's making this really naive assumption, it's all beautifully encapsulated in this name. The name of this algorithm is logistic regression, and I think it's an awesome algorithm. 
I think it is an awful name. Why is it an awful name? First of all, it's not doing regression. It's doing classification. You know, people called it regression because technically it's regressing into the real value that is the probability, but I think that's very confusing. Uh, and instead of using the term logistic, logistic is technically a parent name for a sigmoid. I would have called it, Chris would have called it the sigmoid classification algorithm. So I just want to point this out that it's not a very good name. Um, it's uh, really not doing regression. It is doing classification. But of course, it's not that important right now. What is important is the final mystery. If you understand this model, you're most of the way there. You understand what logistic regression is doing, but now you need to peel back to the next level of detail. You need to understand under the hood this next most complicated mechanism, which is where does the intelligence come from and how could you make your logistic regression algorithm as smart as possible? What a mystery. Let's dive in. The intelligence of a logistic regression model comes from its thetas. If you took a logistic regression model and you gave me random thetas, it would be awful at making predictions. I'd have no reason to trust it. But if you gave me perfect thetas, then maybe you could start to do a good job. The intelligence lives in those thetas, which begs the question, how are we going to get good values of theta? And I mentioned this earlier, but the answer is we have a technique for choosing parameters. This is a probabilistic model. It's producing a probability. We can think about the likelihood of a training data set, and we could ask the question, which values of these parameters would maximize likelihood? That's a long way of saying we can just use the parameter estimation techniques we've learned so far. We can take training data and choose these parameters based on training data. So we're gonna do this. We're gonna take training data and we're going to try and learn them using this idea of maximum likelihood. Remember when we first learned maximum likelihood? I said, oh, imagine we're trying to estimate the parameters of a normal distribution and I give you data points and you can try and choose the parameters that maximize the likelihood of those data points. We came up with a nice way of doing that and that's exactly the idea we're going to use for choosing the parameters. I'm going to do something a little bit different though. Today I'm gonna to focus on what's most important for you for your problem set, which is what are the results of the mathematics? Once you understand how you could use those results, then we're gonna drive them. Does that sound good? So we're gonna start with the end point. We are going to use maximum likelihood of estimation. We're going to start with the logistic assumption that for any data in a database, for example, or a training data set, the probability that the label takes on the value one given the features is going to be sigma of theta transpose x. That's a logistic regression assumption. And of course, that also means that we assume that the probability y equals zero is just going to be one minus that. Those are our assumptions. Based on those assumptions, we could call this uh, some measure of the probability that, or this is the probability that y equals one. Then we can take training data set and we can figure out the likelihood based on this assumption. And once you get the likelihood, you can get the log likelihood. And then what we're going to do is we're going to be able to figure out how we get the derivative of log likelihood. Now, you're going to later in class understand the mathematics for how we got this equation. You'll understand the mathematics for how we got this equation. But before we drive into any of that mathematics, you need to understand the plot line. And the plot line is we're going to make this assumption. Then we're going to say, based on data, I can say, how likely does that data look under a particular set of parameters? And that's this function. So if you gave me any data set and you gave me a particular setting of parameters, I could put those two things together through that equation number two and it will score it. You'll score your parameters and say, you know, these parameters are making the data look really likely or these parameters look pretty bad. I can now tell the difference between random parameters and smart parameters because smart parameters would make training data look really, really likely. Again, we'll understand this later. I wanna make sure people understand the plot line. This in itself is a scoring function. It doesn't tell you how to get good thetas. So that's where the derivative comes in. I make the assumption, I figure out a way to score your parameters, and I say, you wanna choose good parameters, pal? You give me the derivative. 
And not just any derivative, I want the derivative of your score with respect to every parameter you might be changing. We'll be able to calculate that numerically, we'll come up with an equation for it, and this equation is the thing we give to our optimization algorithm. At this point, we're happy to hand this over to gradient ascent, and we say, choose the values of theta that maximize this scoring function, and hey, I know gradient ascent, you really want derivatives, so I'm gonna give you some derivatives. So at this point, we're willing, ready to give things over to optimization, and optimization will start changing values of thetas. It'll start coming up with good values of thetas that'll eventually make the score really high. A question, though. Is this log likely to be convex? Is it convex? Yes, it is. It is convex, so that is a very, very nice property of our log likelihood function. Okay, plot line questions. I have a similar question. I was wondering, uh, are we doing this because of, uh, because the logistic is a sigmoid, so it's only has one maximization, but then that's a convex, so, you know, it's a confused product. Yeah, you know, I mean, just to go back, we're trying to choose these parameters, and the idea of convexity would suggest that maybe there's really easy ways to choose these parameters um, that didn't require going to gradient ascent. Uh, and it also has other implications. If you end up with good parameters that are a local maxima, do you believe that it could be a global maxima? And it turns out all these things just end up being true. It is a very nice maximization thing. If you end up running gradient ascent, if you get to a peak, I can guarantee you it's the global peak. It's not just a peak, it will be the top of the mountain. Um, yeah, and I'm, just, I'm just wondering, like, say for example, you have a problem where it maximizes and then it So if it maximizes the score, which we use the leg likelihood function for, if you find some thetas that maximize the score, they'll be good. Okay. And they'll be the best thetas. The, the optimization algorithm won't actually return you back bad thetas. Good, good question. So at this point, I've talked a little bit about passing this equation off to an algorithm. Before we get into driving each of these steps, I want you to see the whole plot line, and the whole plot line really ends with passing this off to an optimization algorithm. What does that look like? Well, gradient ascent, come on and play, our old friend you. Remember gradient ascent? It says, hey, if you want to end up with really awesome parameters, we're going to repeatedly hill climb. And by hill climb, I mean take your old parameter and then we're going to figure out the derivative of your score with respect to that parameter. And we're going to multiply that by a step size and add that and that will become our new parameter. So we're always updating it. If there's just one parameter, you can imagine this is like taking small steps, either making the parameter larger or maybe making the parameter smaller if this is negative. Step size is always positive. Uh, and then just slowly making your way towards the ideal value of the parameter. If there is multiple parameters, not a problem. We're just going to be, each of them is going to be making its progress uh, in sync. I think this is nice to show as mathematics, but I find this algorithm much easier to look at. Sorry, I'm gonna skip that a little bit. And I'm gonna take this focus where we say, we want to update each parameter we're going to use the idea of gradient ascent. And gradient ascent requires a derivative, but I gave you what the derivative was. We didn't prove it, but I told you that this was the derivative, and I want to show you how we'll use it. If somebody gives you the derivative for any particular theta j, so the derivative of your score with respect to theta j, you would plug this into here, and this is the equation that tells you how you should change each of your theta j's on every step. It says, as you're trying to get up this mountain, on every step, update every theta. Take the old value, calculate this complicated thing, you can have Python do that for you, it'll come back as a number, and that number, when you multiply by step size, we're gonna use that to change the value. The old value will get modified by whatever this derivative is. And we'll put that in a whole loop. We'll loop this many times and the parameters get better and better and better. That's the promise of hill climbing. But while it's nice to give you the mathematics, I think it's a little bit nicer to give you pseudocode. The very simple idea of logistic regression is this is a two-step algorithm. First, you initialize your parameters, and then you optimize them. But that's too high level. Let's dive a little bit deeper. When you're optimizing them, 
you're going to repeat many times taking a step. To take a step, you're going to calculate all the gradients, and then every single theta is going to be I, it's going to be changed by the step size. This n is not the number of data points. This um, is the step size times the gradient of j. We're going to take all those gradients and we're going to store them into numbers. The gradients will eventually become numbers, and we want to calculate those actual numbers. That's kind of a, a wild thing, you know. We think about derivatives as being equations. But if you actually were to substitute all of your data points and all of your thetas, this wouldn't just be an equation, it'd be something that would turn into a single number. The derivative would actually be a value, um, a real value, and then we're going to take that real value and store it into a variable. And we're going to use that to update theta j. Of course, this requires that we can calculate that gradient. And calculate the gradient, you know, you're going to have to loop for every parameter. And for every parameter, you're going to have to loop over all training um, examples, and then you're going to have to actually update your gradient. And you know, using the equation we gave before, this is a pretty reasonable thing to do. You could take, you know, for every training example, you could calculate this term, sum them all together, that's your gradient. At this point, I don't want you to have memorized this. This will make much more sense when you sit down to actually code it, and you'll look at this and be like, okay, yes, I need to get my gradients. Uh, we've got an equation for gradients. I can calculate the gradient at each step point, and then I'm going to repeat many times, improving. But hopefully now I've shown you the whole plot line. You know, you've got, <laughs> well, actually, okay, maybe I'll stop here. We want to become smart by getting great parameters. That's where the intelligence comes from. First, we derive a log likelihood function. That's a score. It tells you if your parameters are good or bad. Then we want to choose parameters that make that score as large as possible. So then we get the derivative. We calculate the derivative, and then we use or gradient ascent to choose the values of the parameters that maximize our score. And that uses hill climbing, aka gradient ascent, which requires you to be able to calculate derivatives. So we needed to have figured out the derivative, which we did, and then this ends up being Python. When you run this whole thing, it will repeat many times, and at the end, it will give you back good values of thetas, not just the initial assignment to thetas. Okay. That's it. That's, that's the next hardest thing. We'll talk about those derivations in a second. But just to make sure we're following on the plot line, I want to show you this very important chart. It's both meant to give you insight into what I've been talking about, but it's also a great debugging technique. The promise of hill climbing is that you might start out with bad thetas, but over time, as you do this gradient ascent, your thetas will get better and better, and better and better, particularly in terms of this score that we call the log likelihood or the likelihood. So when you start out, you start out with random values of thetas, and your score is going to be pretty low. But if you took one step of gradient ascent, it will end up moving all of your thetas. It will depend on the gradient for each theta, so they could all move differently. And once you get those gradients, we're going to take one step and they'll change ever so slightly. We've now gone from the first step of our algorithm to the next time through the loop. And an important thing that's going to happen is, because we changed all these parameters, with respect to the derivative of the score with respect to each parameter, we're guaranteed that the score should go up. So the next time we calculate our score, it should be higher. It's not the final version of our parameters. We'd like to repeat this gradient ascent many steps. So again, we get the derivative of the score with respect to every parameter, and they'll all change once again. So now they've changed twice, and we get to the next iteration of our algorithm. And again, we're guaranteed that these changes should make the score go up. So at this point, we've got a third incarnation of our parameter values, and our score is starting to look pretty good. Gradient ascent, if you kept doing it, your score should just keep going up and up and up. And that's what gradient ascent is doing. It's just giving you a way to change your parameters so that your score goes up. And an important debugging idea you can get from this is, Let's say your algorithm's not working. It could happen. You could go and code this up, you could run it, and it could not be giving you the results you wanted. One thing is you might have gotten your derivatives wrong. And if you get your derivatives wrong, it might be, not be the case that likelihood is actually going up. 
um, over different iterations. So this is something that I often used when I was implementing logistic regression or neural networks to make sure that I had actually coded it up correctly. Okay. And then finally, I just wanted to take this moment to remind you of this one detail, which was, don't forget, we still have the intercept term. Remember we had a theta zero? And that theta zero was going to be added into our sum before we threw it into the squashing function. So before we came up with the squashing function, we're gonna add in the theta zero. And don't forget that the way we actually implement that is by making um, x zero always equal to one. If you make x zero always equal to one, no matter who the user is, then that will be the same as adding an intercept. Okay. So classification we've already talked about, so I'm going to actually go quit pretty quickly through that. You know, you get the probability that y equals one. If that's greater than 0.5, you predict a one. Otherwise, you predict a zero. For the actual prediction we make, we call that y hat. How cute. It's like our guess at y, and that hat is like making us look a little silly so that you can tell that we're a guess and we're not the actual value. Anyways, I don't think that's so surprising at this point. So you get this value. If it's greater than 0.5, you predict a one. Okay. But um, you know, just to be clear, once you've got good thetas, you should be able to take a new user, set their inputs to 0, 1, 1 for this particular user. Then you should be able to do your forward pass, get a value of z, squash it, get the probability, if that probability is greater than 0.5, then you predict a 1. Oh, you guys worked really hard to follow that plot line. It's a pretty complicated plot line. There's a lot of moving pieces. But at this point, hopefully you believe me when I say, okay, you can make this model. Okay, we can score it. And if you can score it, then you can choose parameters that maximize that score using gradient ascent. But what I haven't told you, the missing part of the story was, where did those equations come from? And maybe you don't need to know. You know, if you actually have to just code this up for your homework, you could skip this final part of where do those equations come from. You could just look up the slides, get those equations, code it into Python, run it, get the right answer, you know, have your good times, go play with your friends. But I'm gonna give you a reason for why you should care about where those equations come from. Because logistic regression is just the start of the story. This is a good idea that you can imagine is a seed. And this seed has blossomed in wonderful and complicated ways. So to the extent that you can understand this seed is the extent to which you could understand deep learning. So we should really know all the different parts, especially if you wanna either be the ones to make this flourish, or as you guys know, AI is going to require us to understand it. It's having big impacts on society, and we need to really, really get our heads around what these powerful tools are doing. For both those reasons, we really want to know how this black box is going to be working. So you guys ready for jumping into this math? Okay, let's do it. Okay, so I gave you these equations. I said, this is our assumption. Based on the assumption, you can get that this is the score, and then we can derive score with respect to each parameter. But I didn't tell you step by step how you get these two values. So let's do it. How do we get that log likelihood function? As you recall, a very funny thing happened when we wanted to do MLE on a Bernoulli. When we wanted to do MLE on a Bernoulli, the first step is you've got training data. That'll be a bunch of zeros and ones. Can you write how likely that training data looks based on the parameters? In the case of a Bernoulli, there's only one parameter. That's the probability parameter P. Do you remember Bernoulli, it's either a one or a zero, and it's one with probability p. If you were doing MLE to choose a Bernoulli, your, your job was to choose a p. And the MLE step-by-step -step formula, the first phase of MLE says, write down, how, write down a likelihood function, which often would require you to write down the probability mass function. A Bernoulli probability mass function looks like this, but we have this issue that the Bernoulli probability mass function which says, you know, the probability of a one should be whatever your parameter p is. The probability of zero should be one minus that p. This really simple thing is not derivable. Those bar charts weren't derivable. So even though the Bernoulli is a simple concept and has a simple probability mass function, we couldn't write a likelihood function for Bernoulli's that was derivable. So instead, we did this super cheeky thing where we came up with a derivable version of this bar chart. That derivable version of this bar chart looks like this. It takes your parameter and raises it to y, 
Remember for Bernoulli, y can only be 0 or 1. And then it multiplies it by this other term, which is 1 minus the parameter raised to the power of 1 minus y. Insanity! But insanity that we need to understand. This is what people use in logistic regression and deep learning and beyond for likelihoods of a Bernoulli, because this is going to be derivable. This is equivalent to the bar chart when y equals 0 or 1. And let's just do one example of that to remind ourselves. Let's take this equation and plug in 1 for y. If you plug in 1 for y, you get p to the power of 1. Everybody, what's p to the power of 1? P. Oh, OK, good. So we have p, that's good, multiplied by this other scary term. Ooh. Well, if y was 1, what's 1 minus y? And what's whatever raised to the power of 0? 1. OK, so we have p times 1, which gives us? Oh, yay. OK, so this is really nice. When you put in a 1 for y, it gives you back p. So if you put in a 1 for y, you get back p. And it turns out if you put in a 0 for y into this crazy equation, you'll just get back 1 minus p. It's a really, really complicated way of writing that bar chart. But we needed to do this because it made it derivable. Recalling that, the first step of MLE means take this assumption and now imagine you had a training data set and write how likely does that training data set look in the face of the current setting of parameters. Score the parameters by coming up with a likelihood function. Imagine that you just had one thing in your training data point. The way we could score it is we could use the Bernoulli. We could say, hey, take your single training data point, and if you put that x, the inputs of the training data point, if you did transpose of theta and put it through a sigmoid, this whole thing here, that is the probability that y equals 1. It's the parameter p of y, which is a Bernoulli. You know, this thing here, that's the p of your Bernoulli. The whole thing that comes out of logistic regression equation is the probability that y equals 1. And if we use that continuous derivable version of a Bernoulli probability mass function, it says, you know, the likelihood that y takes on its value, which could be a 0 or 1 for a data point in your data set, given the inputs for that single data point is going to be p to the power of either the 1 or 0, that is y, times 1 minus p to the power of 1 minus the 1 or 0, that is y. So to be clear, your data point would have an x. And the x could be something like, hey, remember x0 is always a 1, always a 1. But maybe there's three other features, and they represent whether people like the mo different movies, and it could be a 0, 0, 1. And in this case, y is going to be a number 0 or 1. And theta. It's going to be a list which could be like, you know, negative 7, 2, 0, 3, which will be the ways that you weight x before you squash it and get the probability that y equals 1. And we're going to score this combination. You have your data, you have your training data, which at this point is hilariously just one. How funny would it be to train a whole machine learning algorithm with one data point? No, we want a lot of data points. Why am I starting with one? Because the math is easier. So let's start with one. So if you have one data point and you, have, you want to score this theta, you would calculate the probability that y equals 1 based on these thetas. So you'd take this theta, transpose it with x, that gets your weighted sum, squash it, and that squash will give you the probability that y equals 1. And if you put that into this equation, for y we're going to substitute 1, because that's what the data point says, and that means we're going to ignore this whole thing and we'll just be left with this term. So it'll just be the probability that y equals 1. So if our data point had a 1, this likelihood function will just return you back the number which is the probability your algorithm said that the data point would be 1. Take a moment and talk to the person next to you and see if you can ask a question about why that's true. Because I do want to stop here. This seems like if you can follow this, the rest will be just math. So talk to the person next to you. See if you can come up with a question. What's confusing about this or what could I understand more deeply? Uh, take a minute and a half just to have a chat.
Okay, what are we doing here? We want to choose good thetas. MLE tells us how, but the first thing you have to do with MLE is you have to come up with a scoring function. Say, how good do my thetas look like based on some real training data? We thought about this in the case where you have just a single data point. And my claim for you is if you have just a single data point, you can calculate this equation, which will return you back a single number, which will be the score of how good your thetas are for that single data point. But it's a very confusing thing. There's a lot going on here. You have logistic regression. You have interpreting the output as a probability of a Bernoulli. We have the continuous derivable probability mass function of the Bernoulli. And all three of those things are happening at the same time. It's just so much that we should ask some good questions. Any questions come up? Yes. When we have inputs that aren't binary, how do we transform this? Good question. So the question is, if we have inputs that are not binary, how will this get transformed? I have good news for you. If your inputs are non-binary, you could use the exact same thing. It's just the x's will happen to be not zeros and ones. If the output happens to be non-binary, it becomes much more complicated because we're going to be interpreting the output of this logistic regression as a probability of a Bernoulli. And so if you can have your y take on non-Bernoulli values, it's going to not work. So inputs can change to be anything, but output we're going to say has to be zero and ones. Good questions. And I owe you mandarins. I am going to keep aside the three mandarins that I owe. Yes? For naive bays, sorry, wait, actually. For naive bays, um, we, were, we were able to do joint, um, joint distribution, joint probabilities of like multiple random variables. Are we going to see an example of this here, or do we just assume the y's a vector? So in naive Bayes, we could have x be a vector. And here you can also have x be a vector. In both cases, x can have lots of features. Um, and in both cases, the thing you're predicting is always just a 0 or a 1. So both of them are going to have the exact same format. x can be large, y will be either a single 0 or 1. And this is a little bit hard to see, but my x is bolded just to try and show that it could be a whole list. You know, my x can be a whole list of numbers, whereas my y will either be a 0 or 1, which is the exact same format as naive Bayes. You are right that in naive Bayes, there's much more interpretable way of talking about the joint likelihood of x and y, whereas this one's not trying to do a joint. It's just trying to talk about the probability of y given x. <laughs> so naive Bayes is trying to do something a little more complicated. That's why I asked to make this assumption. Good, good question. Yes? Why do we need to be concerned about multicollinearity? Why don't you need to be concerned about it? Well, the idea being gradient ascent will choose good the uh, thetas even if things are collinear or not collinear. It will still be able to just optimize. Let's talk about that after class. Okay, yes? Um, so, you're basically saying that the, the output of our machine learning is like is a Bernoulli and it's got some p value and we're basically assuming what p is by like saying in our case we're saying it's a signal function but you could use something else. You yeah can't. that's exactly it. It's just saying okay I'm assuming this y is a Bernoulli. I need a little mechanism to get the probability of it being one. I've got logistic regression. You could have made a different machine but logistic machine is the machine that we chose and that's what we've got and because that's what we've got because this is really a Bernoulli we can just write a likelihood function. Does signal just happen to work really well, or is there a reason? No, it squashes nicely. <laughs> There's not a deeper reason. It's a squashing function. Think of it being practical, uh, not being driven by deep neuroscience or something like that. Yes, question. So here, um, the probability is the transpose of theta multi you know, uh, multiplied with x yes. passed through the sigmoid, and so that whole thing is to the power y, right? Yes, this is a probability. This is the parameter p of our Bernoulli. Okay, and why do the thetas change? That's one thing that I had trouble understanding in the previous explanation. So like with each equation. We want the thetas to change. Right. So we, 
first thing, we're just going to come up with a scoring function, but then we're going to use a scoring function to change our thetas. And we want to change this thetas to make the scoring function go as large as possible. So you can think about the score. The thetas are our movables. They're things that we can move, and your job is to move them, and move them in a good direction. So that's why they change, is because it will end up making this thing smarter. But we still need to derive this in order to figure out exactly how we should make them change. So your first claim, though, I think was very helpful. I think that's something I really want to highlight. This whole thing, we could have just called the p to our parameter. And in fact, you will sometimes see people give this whole thing a different symbol to represent it because it's just used so much. And, and this equation would have been a lot easier if we said something like, we call this p hat, and we just started using p hat symbol anytime you saw this. It would make this maybe a little bit more readable, and some people do do that. Okay, you guys rock. Those are very good questions. The great thing about likelihood is that if you assume all your data points are IID, so each data point's independent of other data points, different from the naive Bayes assumption that's assuming the features are independent, if you assume the data points are independent, which is very reasonable, then the likelihood of more than one point is just going to be the product over many, many points of the exact same function that we had here. So take that and just put it through a loop of multiplication. So it says for every data point in my data set, we're going to calculate its likelihood. So this was the likelihood of one data point, and we want the data points, the product of the likelihood of every data point in our data set. So then we can just substitute in here. Notice that if y was always one, we wouldn't need this term. But for some of our data points, y will be one. And for other data points, y will be zero. And don't forget that this is just picking out either p or 1 minus p. OK. And that's a scoring function. Yes? So the little i's are not actually x products. You're indicating which x or y we're looking at right now? Yes, exactly. And particularly, it's which data point. Okay. So here, this is saying, oops, pen. This is not an exponent. It's just saying the ith data point. And this is the same notation that they use in 221 uh, and 229. So uh, I did want to start using that notation here to set you guys up, if you ever take those classes, which you don't have to, but they're kind of fun. I digress. So yeah, this is saying your data point has n values, and we're going to loop i being the index of the current data point you're on, uh, and we're going to calculate this for the current data point. This was one data point, but in the next data point, this could be like, superscript 0, or superscript 5, let's say. Um, and then the next data point, maybe, you know, you have different inputs and a different y. Now, I skipped ahead to this. This is a scoring function. It would have been just fine. But if you try and program this for a large data set, you'll have underflow problems. So instead of just using the scoring function, we're going to use the log of it, because log is monotonic. If this is a good scoring function, the log of it will also be a good scoring function, so let's use the log. Okay, so at this point, I've given you the mathematics for the first equation that you saw, which was this is the scoring function for how good your parameters are. And we're not there yet. The last thing we need to do is be able to say, okay, that's a scoring function. Give me a way to make my parameters better, which means we need a gradient. We have to be able to drive that scoring function, that thing that can take a theta and say this is good or bad, and we want the derivative of that score with respect to each parameter. Okay, we're going to do something brave. Before we do it, though, know this thing about sigmoids. Sigmoids are not just a squashing function. They're a squashing function with the most beautiful derivative. If you wanted to know the derivative of a sigmoid, it is equal to the sigmoid itself times 1 minus the sigmoid. If you notice the sigmoid function has this natural base e, and as you know, natural base e is the very special number where if you had to take its derivative of e to the power of x, it has that nice property of not changing. For similar reasons, because sigmoid has the e natural base in it, its derivative ends up being very, very nice. This is gorgeous. That is another reason we use sigmoids, by the way. It's a squashing function with a beautiful, easy derivative. Okay. Whew. 
you now have a likelihood function. Oh, and before we do that, I just want to show you guys what this could look like using the sigmoids derivative before we do any hard derivatives, or hard um, likelihood derivatives. So this is an aside. Welcome to my little aside. I just told you sigmoid has a beautiful derivative that's in the top right. And I want us to practice using the sigmoids derivative. And particularly, I want us to calculate the derivative of this expression with respect to one of the thetas. Just as practice, just as warm up. What you should do is you should use chain rule. You should say this is a composition of doing step one. This is step one. And then once you do step two, you, step two is to put this through the sigmoid function. If you have a two-step process, it's a good candidate for something you can break apart using the chain rule. Particularly, I'm going to say that z is going to be equal to theta transpose x. You know, z is just the input to the sigmoid. And so this is going to be the same as the derivative of sigmoid z with respect to z and the derivative of z with respect to theta j. As I said, you should practice chain rule. You should make sure you know it, watch the Khan Academy, and make sure you can follow exactly this example. Because this is the application that is most important of chain rule. Now, if you want to plug and chug, this derivative of sigmoid z with respect to z is just going to be sigmoid of z times 1 minus sigmoid of z. So sigmoid of z times 1 minus sigmoid of z. Remember, um, z is just theta transpose x, so sigmoid of z is that, and 1 minus sigmoid of z is that. So that is just that first expression. The derivative of sigmoid of z with respect to z is just sigmoid z times 1 minus sigmoid z. Done. And then we need this expression. What's the derivative of z with respect to a particular theta of j? And I'll tell you the answer right now, but let's understand why. If you're deriving this expression, with respect to a particular theta. Let's say you're deriving this, so the derivative of theta transpose x with respect to theta 5. Recall what this is. You know, it's theta 0 times x0, plus theta 1 times x1, plus theta 2 times x2. Where does theta 5 show up? Only times x5. The only part of this term where theta 5 shows up is when it's multiplied by x5. That's the only place. So if you derive this whole thing with respect to theta 5, it would be the same as deriving theta 5 times x5 with respect to theta 5. And if you're deriving this simple multiplication with respect to theta 5, what is it? Oh, you guys said it so timidly. Say it loud. I want to hear it. People in recording want to hear your voices. Yeah, that's just x5. More generally, if you're deriving this with respect to theta j, it will be xj. So if j was 5, it would be x5. If j was 3, it would be x3. Okay, so a simpler way of writing the exact same thing would be is you could have declared this to be y hat, and then this is just, you know, uh, sigmoid of z times 1 minus z times xj, which is the same as this expression times 1 minus this expression times xj. This is just a really cleaner way of writing what we derived before, where y hat is equal to this sigmoid of z. So sigmoid of z times 1 minus sigmoid of z times xj. That is the derivative. OK, we don't have time for pedagogical pause. We took the question before. Are you guys ready? This is Stanford. We can do this. That is the thing that I want you to drive in terms of theta j. Bum, bum, bum. OK, just go and drive it. Ah. We can do this. <laughs> Here are a couple pro tips. This is going to be the derivative of a sum of the logs, right? So this is the thing we're driving, and it's got a big sum here. Let's start by just doing the derivative of one of these inner things, because the derivative of sum is just the sum of derivatives. So if you can do the derivative of the inner part, your life will become really easy. The derivative of sums is the sum of derivatives. Just tell me the derivative of this inner part. So then my question becomes a little bit easier. Can you derive this? And particularly, any time I see a sigmoid of theta transpose x, every time I see this thing, I'm going to call it y hat. 
because that notation makes things so much easier to read. And if you call that y hat, then this is going to be just derive this with respect to a theta j. You're like, where are all my thetas? Oh, don't forget the thetas are actually in the y hats because the y hats are actually this expression. So they're still there, but that's the derivative we're trying to do. Okay, now derive this inner thing with respect to theta j, where I'm using this shorthand for y hat, which is sigmoid of theta transpose x. Idea of chain rule is this. There are no thetas here. All the thetas are hidden in these y hats because the y hats are my shorthand for sigmoid of theta transpose x. You should not try and do this derivative straight. Instead, you should use chain rule. You should say, all of my thetas are in y hat. So I should derive that whole expression with respect to y hat. And then I should derive y hat with respect to the theta j. Chain rule is decomposition for derivatives. It allows you to take a big derivative and do it in parts. It says, okay, just derive things with respect to y hat, then y hat with respect to theta j. Do those separately and multiply them. So let's start out with what is the derivative of y hat with respect to theta j? I have good news for you. If y hat is this expression, Deriving it with respect to theta j is the thing we did in our warm-up. We actually figured this out. It was sigmoid of theta transpose x times 1 minus sigmoid of theta transpose x times xj. And I just wrote the exact same thing here. Don't, don't forget the y hat was my new shorthand for writing sigmoid of theta transpose j. Hey, we're halfway there. Now all you have to do is derive that expression with respect to y hat. And remember, you're using y hat as a variable. You, at this point, you can forget that y hat equals this at all. Uh, and just say, what is the derivative of this expression with respect to some variable called y hat? Well, if you take this first term, what's the derivative of y log y hat with respect to y hat? Well, this doesn't have y hat, so it'll just come as a term. And log of y hat derived with respect to y hat is just 1 over y hat. And same thing here. Log of 1 minus y hat will just become 1 over 1 minus y hat. But because there's a, you know, a little thing going on inside the log, you have to derive that with respect to y hat, and you get a negative sign. So this positive became a negative sign, and this term just came out here. This whole derivative becomes this term, which is not so bad. And we're done! We just did this crazy hard derivative. It turns out by using chain rule and breaking into the derivative of loss with respect to y hat, derivative of y hat with respect to theta, it becomes not so bad. Um, you could simplify this a little bit if you actually did the math, um, but that's not as important as knowing how to do the derivatives. Now, if you were to do this um, as the sum, you know, we skipped this part, we just did the derivative of the inside, but this will just become the sum of each of those derivatives. So we did this derivative, and then you're just going to sum that over for all your data points, which leaves us at da 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 how you get the derivative of your scoring function with respect to each of the thetas, which brings us to the end of our story. You guys know logistic regression. You guys understand the assumptions. You guys understand how we score it. And now you understand how you could drive the score with respect to each theta j, which you could then put into gradient ascent. Wow, you work so hard. And I have a treat for you. Come back on Wednesday, and I will tell you how this becomes the blossom that is deep learning. We will understand deep learning and the extent that we understand logistic regression. Have a fantastic day. Get started early on problem set six. I appreciate you guys so much. Come back on Wednesday. Cheers, CS109.